Hi, I'm Marty Otanias. Welcome to Getting High on Anthropology. Today we have two guests from Kind Colorado. Welcome Kelly and Courtney. Today we're going to talk about community engagement. We're going to talk about corporate social responsibility in the cannabis sector. So I think I'm going to learn a lot from you guys. And I think for viewers, what might be good is uh, tell me about yourselves and then what is Kind Colorado? What is Kind Colorado? Kind Colorado is a wild, crazy social venture that connects cannabis businesses to community for mutual benefit. So we really believe that cannabis can be an asset in communities, but they need to understand the communities that they're in, they need to understand the issues that are there, and be given an opportunity to contribute there. Our goal is to make and provide tools for community outreach and values-driven business accessible to an industry that has been so focused on keeping their doors open, getting their licenses, changing hearts and minds around the propaganda of cannabis, and yet we're trying to add a whole other layer um, of tools and outreach. So I think that that's what Kind Colorado is for, for most people. What would be one of the recent projects that you're working on that you're really excited about, and then where do you see that project going? This one's very exciting for us because it actually happens tonight, that a community room at the Gathering Place, which is an organization that serves women struggling with poverty, some of whom live on the street, women, or women and folks who identify as being women. And it is a drop-in center. It, it provides wraparound services, so an amazing place. And we were able to reach out with the help of Shannon Brooks from Lightshade, who is a phenomenal client of ours, to several other cannabis businesses. And women in cannabis, I think five, really stood up and raised, we were able to raise $35,000. and. Nonprofits have lots of concerns working with cannabis, and this w happened almost a year ago now, that those women, their businesses were able to come forward, donate dollars, and now a room will be named after them, the community room, which is like the heart tonight. of the gathering place tonight. Oh, that's tonight. great. It's very exciting. And so Leslie Foster and other folks at the gathering place have just been phenomenal leaders in the nonprofit space to, to not be discriminatory against cannabis, which is pretty pretty um, common. And, and nonprofits have real concerns, and they have they have reason to have concerns about the risk and the rewards of working with cannabis. But our communities have needs and cannabis has resources. They're not all dollars. It's time, talent, and treasure. But in this instance, they stepped up with real treasure. So the concerns that nonprofits have regarding cannabis, mm -hmm. do you want to unpack that? Like mm -hmm. we have nonprofits in Colorado mm -hmm. and there are maybe limited opportunities for them to access funds from uh, the cannabis companies. And so what would be, like how do people go through the argument? Like what are some pros and cons of, of uh, nonprofits taking uh, cannabis Money. So the Gathering Place, one of the things that put them in a very unique position is their funding structure. So many nonprofits are wary of partnering with cannabis businesses because they're afraid that they're national funders who will pull dollars from them because it's uh, not a nationally you know, legal substance. And the Gathering Place doesn't have that challenge, so they were able to um, bypass any concerns around national funders to accept cannabis dollars. I think that the other issue is that there are some, there there are still some organizations that fear that they could lose their 501c3 status. So is that a real concern? Sure, but what we always say and what we hear from Tom Downey from Ireland Stapleton often is that the legal line goes on forever and the enforcement line does not. So are the two people in the IRS dedicated to looking at 501c3 applications and reviewing 501c3 status is going to go after your nonprofit because you accepted cannabis dollars? Probably not. So a bit right. of an inflated fear. Yeah, so it's a fear and it's real. We want to value that that concern is there. But what we say is that the risk that you take, it could far, um, the risk that you take could could far outweigh any real enforcement and also the reward that you could receive is great. So you have new businesses with new ideas, a new opportunity for dollars to come into your organization, unrestricted dollars to come into your organization, as well as time and talent on your board of directors or your committee. Right? Think of all the benefits that you could, you could potentially earn from this burgeoning industry if you were just willing to open your doors and partner with them. So oftentimes what we say is maybe don't go after them just for their dollars. Maybe think about inviting them to sit on your board of directors, to sit on a committee, to volunteer with you, learn about the industry, put a face to this industry. We can't be the only ones to demystify and humanize the cannabis industry. Some of that work has to be done on them. So I would think with the visibility that cannabis companies might get by supporting a nonprofit would be an incentive for uh, cannabis companies to give money 
money and then nonprofits to take it, but is there more to this? Yes. yes, that's an interesting point, and there's certainly you know strong marketing restrictions around cannabis dollars, but it isn't really just about visibility. At the beginning, it was really for us very much about social license to operate. Not not it was changing the the folks who are invited to the table and the fact that cannabis businesses are not invited to civically engage is just really silly. Most nonprofits did not get into folks in nonprofits did not get into the work to maintain the status quo forever. We have a cultural sea change on our hands right now. We have need in the community. And organizations that were started to end homelessness that's your aim, right? It isn't. It, we need to take risks to solve social problems. And the fact that these out of the box, kind of creative, innovative thinkers who are kind of screw the manners in some ways, that's kind of a, and we are too, you know, let's see what we can do to solve community problems and what an amazing opportunity for you to share the gifts that you have. But we do run into nonprofits who really do think of them as wallets. Um, and so we just ask our clients and nonprofit partners, and it doesn't have to be nonprofits. They can work with community coalitions that don't have 501c3 status. Mm -hmm. They won't be writing the dollars off anyway. So what, it, what would you like to get out of it? Would you like to sponsor a table? That's one thing. Or would you like to learn about participating in the food bank? That's one thing. Or would you like to think about and be part of the solution to work on the food system access issue in that community? That's something. That's something big. Way outside of the box. But that starts from a familiarity and being treated well. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of underdogs right now. And I, I can't miss an underdog for nothing. i got to get in with an underdog. But soon they will be masters of industry. And I would imagine that they will remember the folks who were willing to stretch themselves and to ask themselves, is this something that we're comfortable with? Is, is this propaganda campaign and the systemic barriers enough to stop us from solving homelessness or mm -hmm. ending hunger in our community or working on to prevent gentrification or understanding what the many issues are involved. No, in I community. really appreciate that reorientation is not just about the dollars it's and not. there's so many other things, relationship building. Mm -hmm. And I've been fortunate to know you for over two years or so. So it seems like there's an issue of equity and parity that sort of is underneath the work you do. So tell me about that. Why is that important to you and what does that mean like in a tangible form? I, I mean, it's everything to me. I've been a social justice professional for 30 years or so. It's everything. And I was the policy advisor at the governor's office when cannabis became legal. So I wasn't part of the Amendment 64. I wasn't part of that process. But when it was put, we had we had we had to do it. And the implementing legislation came, and I could see that there were missing pieces. wasn't passionate particularly about cannabis in general. What I was passionate about was ending the war on drugs and mass incarceration. So. There was no opportunity to change the law as we had it then. And I moved on, did some other work, but came back and saw that cannabis businesses were in fact popping up in communities because it was zoned as alcohol, which was not you know, particularly progressive, equalized policy to begin with. And then we set cannabis right on top of that. So I saw cannabis businesses in a position to not know communities or what even was going on there. That's where they were zoned to operate. And communities really feeling put upon and preyed upon by an industry that they felt like came to take from them. And to try to level the playing field, you know, we had many opportunities. We participated in one together to say, this, these were policy decisions. They were zoned to be here. And there's available space here. That's kind of the confluence of, of interests here. And who would possibly win from the way that you see it? What is the critical way that we could look at this? What is just and what is equitable? And who is your enemy, if that's the way you want to put it? And so there were lots of opportunities for community members to learn that, in fact, it wasn't the cannabis businesses that were there that they were fighting against. It was unjust policies. Mm. And so we worked with cannabis businesses to say, do you see this situation here? If we could bring you to tables and you could listen to the grandmothers and the community members and they told you what their fears were, what would you do with that? And we couldn't know. It was a complete experiment, but we did that multiple times. And many of those, several of those cannabis businesses, in fact, lobbied to the mayor to say, this community, the highest density of cannabis businesses in the world, is um, you know, bringing in between fifty and $300,000 and not having any kind of equal benefit of those right, dollars. Right, not seeing much. Right, mm -hmm. and we were told by city government, but that's just the way that it is. Well, mm -hmm. we get that, but if we were um, ending prohibition right now, do you think we would not have some tax policies that might benefit the people who are carrying this industry mm -hmm. on their backs a little bit mm -hmm. more? When we're talking mm -hmm. about super fun, multiple Superfund sites, multiple development issues, um, so that is all justice work. Mm -hmm. And to, to be able to help people understand what's really happening and what their levers for change are and who could they have at the table with them to try to make things happen, 
And I'm certainly not saying that it's solved. Right. These That's are right. ongoing These uh, are issues. These are ongoing right. issues. That's right. And, and prohibition, right, prohibition was a, and the drug war were a legalized, it was a legalized campaign, you know, of oppression against black, brown, poor, and sick people. And an industry that continues to grow and mature and ensure economic success without those same black, brown, poor, and sick people benefiting from it is just the drug war 2.0. It's still legalized oppression. It's still systemic oppression. And so one of the things that's really important to us is that for the industry to actually demonstrate that they're a community asset, mm -hmm. not just because they need a good story to tell, mm -hmm. and sure they do, and not just for brand differentiation, although that is important, but because we believe that this industry has an absolute opportunity to create equity from the start and to un not only undo the, war, the war, war on drugs and not only make reparations, but to create a pathway for people of color in this country to actually participate in something that's going to be very, very grand. So right? you, you guys have different stakeholders. You have everything from mm -hmm. folks in the community, you have individuals at the corporate sector level. So when individuals actually come to the table, what are some of the conversations like? Because as a company owner, for example, well, I would imagine some of them are maybe primarily interested in the bottom line and maybe they might kind of do some cosmetic gestures for community engagement or corporate social responsibility initiatives. So what, what would be like an example mm -hmm. of the, some of the conversations that um, would be re representative of the things you're engaged in? We get to talk about the coolest things ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, never in my policy work did I ever get to talk in a room full of white men. Like, let's talk about systemic oppression and racism and anti-black racism. And let's talk about how you can, in fact, make more money by doing just things in the community because the Patagonias and the King Arthur Flowers and the Oscar Blues and the companies that are all doing good, I'm sure they're good people there. It also has an ROI. Doing good actually supports your business. And the new wave of kind of corporate activism that we're seeing with the Patagonia, what we suggest to our cannabis clients is be that of your neighborhood, of your state. Take the detriment and the negative impression that people think you're dirty drug dealers and they think the same of us and turn that on its head and take it as your opportunity to lead because you can and because you the pain points of your industry around policy the oppressive tax policies the crazy regulatory structure the things that are your pain points are also your chance mm -hmm. to do something and when we say to a cannabis business owner you know what do you care about and they say no one's ever asked us that I know, but yeah. we really want to know, and we want to tell you what we care about. Mm -hmm. And we don't get to tell people what they should care about, but we do get to provide our work in this like pro-responsible business, social just framework that I've never seen anything like it before. I've never seen an economic driver for the kind of change I'd like to see in community. I'm not saying it's happening as it should, mm -hmm. but I didn't see any new businesses coming to many communities no one inviting them to the table to help build this community. What would it look like if you were part here? Not cannabis in community, but cannabis as community. I like and that. what would your what would you like your legacy to be beyond mm -hmm. having the best sativa in town? Right. You know, what do you want to tell your children? Would you like to um, impact hunger in this community or impact the way seniors are treated in this community? We have or a provide access to medicine. Right? Right. It's mm -hmm. about providing access to medicine right. also to low income poor folks who oftentimes there are many, many barriers for creating a healthy lifestyle for accessing medicine that is going to be life changing for them. And cannabis can be that. I think it's really important when you want something you touched on and that Kelly is touching on is that cannabis businesses because the industry is new and emerging in many many places um, and still evolving in Colorado the the sector the cannabis sectors pain points and individual businesses pain points vary mm -hmm. they vary from month to month from year to year mm -hmm. so while we love to sit down and have conversations with them about equity and justice and becoming a community asset and creating a legacy on systemic change and empowering folks around uh, folks that have historically been left out of this industry, oftentimes that's not at all what they've come to us for, mm -hmm. and it takes building a very trusting long-term relationship with them to even have that conversation, right? The first conversation we're usually having with them is, what is your pain point, and wh how is it that what we do will solve that problem for you? Mm -hmm. And the pain point could be employee turnover, mm -hmm. it could be uh, transitioning from a medical license to a recreational license, it could be a lack of community engagement, it could, be, and it could be so many different things. Mm -hmm. The way we see it, 
doesn't need to be the way that the business owner sees it. We will help solve that problem, but we're very clear that we are accountable to community. And you wouldn't want to hire us if we weren't. This is where our mm -hmm. expertise comes from. This is where the value for our work comes from. And frankly, we believe that cannabis can be moving forward policies that are better than the ones that they are currently being accountable held accountable to because no one knows what they're doing in cannabis policy. If you've been doing cannabis policy for five years, you are a senior in the area. So yeah. let's, what can we aspire to do the best that we could possibly mm -hmm. do? And what we say is cannabis work is one year is seven years, so our business is actually 21 years old. Yeah, it's dog years. Yeah, it's yeah, dog years. Cannabis is dog years. I had no absolutely. gray before uh, cannabis. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was a young person. Yeah. yeah. So a different kind of question is, um, you know, to demystify con Kind Colorado, uh, tell me about like a representative, I mean, you talked about the event tonight, but what services specifically do you offer, and then how do you internally like measure if you were successful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that one of the things that we that we love doing that's sort of low-hanging fruit and easily accessible to our clients is just building a cannabis social responsibility strategy. And what that looks like is developing an impact statement, which is asking them, what do you care about? How do we activate on that? It's understanding what's their investment budget, time, talent, and treasure, right, not just dollars. Good reminder, the industry is taxed at 65 to 75%. Not a, do not a lot of dollars to be had. There's other things there. So you have your impact statement, you have your investment budget, and then we do some community mapping. So here's what you care about, and we're gonna try to understand who in the community uh, exists that has some challenges that we think we can create a mutual benefit there, what you care about, what the community needs. And then from there we're able to look at creating short-term and long-term programmatic goals with those folks we've identified in the community, whether it's a nonprofit or a community organization. Um, and that's sort of fleshing out your entire CSR strategy. And that's something, it's a project basis, it's something you come to us, we can do for you one time, and you can either hire us on an ongoing basis to continue implementing that work for you and managing your community relationships, or you have the capacity and understanding in-house to execute on the strategy we build for you. Because we're always trying to, these relationships are not ours. We don't live in all of the communities. So we are you know, setting you up with formal and informal power as well as working mm -hmm. to move through the barriers that that organization may have to working with cannabis. Mm -hmm. So we want to find something. So it's been veterans work and senior work and lots of food access domestic violence prevention, homelessness mm -hmm. prevention. That has typically been what we've done so far. Our dream prison reentry. You know, when we are able mm -hmm. to connect second chance with uh, multiple cannabis clients so that folks who have literally paid the price have an opportunity to come back to the community. But there's so many things that we do. That's our business model and but we're a social venture. So we need to be sustained and paid for the work that we do. We also try to work on changing hearts and minds and impacting mm -hmm. policy and helping our cannabis business owners to know that you can move things forward mm -hmm. as a business owner in a way that other businesses mm -hmm. have not even mm -hmm. tread. How would you respond to people who, when you look at CSR and you look at it critically and you, um, and again, some of my knowledge is based on public health and tobacco control mm -hmm. and the tobacco industry has a track record of mm -hmm. um, you know, um, embracing CSR, mm -hmm. corporate social responsibility initiatives, but research shows that what they say they do mm -hmm. versus what they actually do, for example, workplace mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. you know, fair wages, living mm -hmm. earnings, um, collective bargaining rights. Mm -hmm. So how would you talk to someone who's critical of CSR as maybe another vehicle or mechanism mm -hmm. that the um, cannabis industry is just using to make themselves look responsible, mm -hmm. but they actually aren't? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So. One of the things that we've been working towards, and some people may call us crazy, is that it is twofold. One is that we develop cannabis social responsibility with cannabis specific pain points in mind. It's trademarked, it's ours, it's our process. We worked very hard on it and we're very proud of it. And it is different than corporate responsibility. And so because it's a little bit different than, than traditional corporate responsibility, our pitch to the sector and to cannabis businesses is that rather than lumping this into your marketing budget, create an entirely separate line item for cannabis social responsibility. It shouldn't be a part of marketing. It shouldn't be necessarily a part of your branding. This should be something that is a 
Biz this is a business practice. This is a business goal, and it's going to have business outputs for you. And we, the reason that we want them to do that is we want them to create a value for it. We want them to have dedicated staff and resources towards it, and know that the metrics are going to be different than traditional marketing metrics, right? When you most businesses launch a CSR, a corporate social responsibility platform or program, they're looking at some very traditional marketing me metrics in order to determine if that was successful. With cannabis, so, uh, with cannabis social responsibility, we're actually looking for outcomes in communities that are going to be a tiny bit different than your than your average marketing metrics. We're not looking at products being pushed off the, sell, set, uh, off the shelves or number of consumers asking for your product or posting about it on Instagram, although those are important. What we're looking for is in when we're measuring success of cannabis social responsibility is what you said you care about being activated on and are those, are, are those activation strategies and those programs actually having value and meaning and causing change in communities. No, right? it's really so, helpful. Yeah. And they weren't, this isn't blood money again. This isn't a po an apology for mm -hmm. we are so sorry the way we've ravaged your community. This is a new industry operating under the, the gui guardrails that it has, but it isn't sued into doing it. So I would challenge you in your enthusiasm, you saying tobacco was enthusiastically taking on a CSR. Mm -hmm. No, they were sued into it. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. blood and death and uh, hardship. And they agreed to do it because they had to do it. We're suggesting to cannabis do it because you can do it and you will get the benefits as we see other value-based businesses getting the benefits. Um, but if you want to wait until there are some lawsuits and more research and data, you could probably wait for that. We would suggest you, you hone your muscle here now because you get to. Um, what a privilege to be someone who contributes to the community. 24,000 jobs cannabis has created in, in Colorado since its onset and still doesn't have the no one says thank you. The city of Denver doesn't say thank you. The state of Colorado doesn't say thank you because we're still nervous about it. So do things that you'd be very, very proud to talk about and also run really tight businesses that follow all of the laws and push those laws to be more just, to have more equitable opportunity for people to participate and more equitable benefit that it's not just 10 white guys that are benefiting, but it's also communities. It's also those employees. It's also an opportunity for not just diversity, but inclusive opportunities for um, rising in your career because there are good jobs and they take good care of their people and they cannot write off anything. 280E, the IRS exclusion, does not allow them to write off their benefits, maternity leave, health care, any of those things. And we know that all businesses aren't doing those things equally, but the ones that are doing amazing jobs, they're, they don't get to write that off. Does, mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. does the work you're doing um, intersect with the, in the Denver metro area, the community engagement plans? And if so, how, what's the relationship? And explain to people who haven't heard of community engagement plans, mm -hmm. what those are. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so community engagement plans, that law was required as part of uh, Denver's cannabis law, recreational businesses, and also um, manufacturing infused product facilities each year are required to get a new license. And a community engagement plan was added. I think it was um, Rafael Espinoza and um, Paul Lopez that worked on that. It is meaningful because it, they care about community. They knew the impact was going to be negative on communities of color based on their experience in city council and they heard from angry community members. And so that was, an, in 2015, kind of an addendum added on to, to May 2015, I think. Mm -hmm. But it really has no teeth. It really says, and it wasn't there, you know, it just has no teeth. There's no enforcement part of it. It says, who have you engaged with in the community? Have you reached out to the registered neighborhood associations? What do you plan on doing in the community? So we really take it and make it much more robust and have it actually be what you plan on. What is your impact statement? What outcomes are you seeking in the community? And we let, cannabis business owners know that you are every year people can see if you did this or not so because there's no one out enforcing it to say you did it or not but the ones who are going far and beyond will we believe they will be recognized for the amazing work that they're doing we also think that we, we, we struggle a little bit about requirements like that because mm -hmm. we don't want to fund shoes for dogs. We don't want to fund, not that some dogs don't need shoes, but we want to fund things that really matter in the community that you're looking at a critical lens and an equitable lens to, to help the, mm -hmm. those who need the most. Um, yeah. We don't want to say don't care about pets, but we're really more interested in how do we mm -hmm. serve communities from this cultural sea change. And the c community engagement plans, one thing that's really interesting to note here is that Whenever they were first came out and required, 
we would be lying if we didn't if we didn't say that we jumped up and down a little bit, right? Because this was going to have direct impacts on our business, and we did get clients from it. But over time, those clients did not return, and it's because there was no enforcement. And so, there is a divide in the sector, and even between Kelly and I on certain days, as to whether or not it should be mandatory or whether or not it should be best practice. But I think what most people can agree on is that community engagement planning, community outreach, social responsibility, sustainability whatever you name it should be should be cannabis sector owned mm -hmm. members of the general public or for example university students if they want to learn more about the guts of these plans whether it's SEPs community engagement plans mm -hmm. or uh, cannabis responsibility plans mm -hmm. are they available or like are they another kind of protected area where we can't understand exactly what's going on we can just hear what people say so they're probably available through the um, city of De city and county of Denver excise and licensing you'll probably see them um, that information is pretty open, but you would not see extensive plans unless you saw our clients or some other exceptions. Mm -hmm. Because it could be something, I don't believe it is. Mm. I don't think it is, it's probably public record. But it could be written, I mean, how this is how little accountability there is. It could be written on the back of a napkin. I talked mm. to the registered neighborhood associations because I could. I mean, not quite. No, <laughs> pretty much, almost. We don't want it that They have way. a form. They have a form you're supposed to, to fill out, out and submit, but it's a check in the box. Did mm. you submit the form? Did right. you not submit the form? But how would we expect a new business owner to also know about the equity framework and justice in a community and who is the least among us in a community that they're not even from? I think that's a pretty tall reach. We, yeah. If you reach out to the neighborhood association, and let me say that poor communities didn't have neighborhood associations until they were required to, to have a say in cannabis regulations sometimes. Because I know my neighborhood association is about what color are your gutters, and they're not taking care of the hungry in my community. We didn't set up neighborhood mm -hmm. associations to do that. So that's why we have to do some digging to find out who is caring for, what are the key issues, and how do we connect cannabis to that if they care about it. Because we don't want it to be a one-off. We want it to be the beginning of a relationship where you work on that issue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think one area where we definitely agree is we want the sector to work better for more people. Absolutely. And the work that you guys do, I think it's really important. Obviously, um, having more companies engaged and obviously more communities. But what advice would you have for you know, community members and or university people who want to do some kind of research or creative project to either help the work you're doing or just to educate others of the value of responsibility and accountability um, within the cannabis sector. There are other states that have better laws. California, I would say, has built into it the opportunity or the hope to have a social justice fund that makes reparations on communities impacted by the war on drugs. We don't have that. So we're kind of a free market trying to do that because we care about it. Other states have those policies. How will they work? What does it actually look like on the ground? Is a fund, even a $100 million fund, does it ever trickle down? I don't believe in trickle down. I think it's grassroots up. That's how we make change. I've never seen trickle down work. So I would say a policy comparisons, even unpacking what our law really says. If you ask regular Denverites or Coloradans, mm -hmm. have you benefited from legal cannabis? I, you know, I think that money went for the schools. Mm -hmm. Actually, first 41 million, capital school construction, not education school buildings, and I'm not saying buildings aren't important, and a little bit of anti-bullying funds and a little bit of early literacy dollars. If we don't like that framework, which I don't particularly, what are our values? What is the public, what do we need to do for public health education? How much dollars are being spent for public safety? That Colorado's dollars are not huge. Denver's municipal dollars are a lot of dollars. I would like to see very transparently how are those dollars spent and as a community if we don't think those are they're doing the right things if youth are still arrested at eight times the rate black and brown youth are eight times the rate of white kids in Colorado everything is not okay we have not done well I don't need to be protected from cannabis I need to be protected from police brutality from unfair lending practices from gentrification from my brothers and sisters that are living in the street I don't need to be protected from cannabis it is natural for us to talk about the drug war and all of the impacts that that has had on communities of color and low-income folks and yet there is so few multimedia that exists where that story has a face to it mm -hmm. and looking at not only the the historical context of who are the people that have been impacted by the war on drugs and if they're touching the industry what does it look and feel like for them now are they still afraid what are the consequences that they have from their families what are the consequences they have from their neighbors how are they operating I think that if there were more folks out there who are interested in capturing stories of the people who are uh, touching the industry impacting 
respected by the industry and putting a face um, to the to that narrative would be really really powerful and we're just not seeing a ton of it yet this might be a good place to end because we'll run out of time so Courtney Mathis and Kelly Perez with Kind Colorado I want to thank you for being on the show I want to thank you for watching Getting High on Anthropology this is Marty Otanias and have a nice day